Ken Albala is professor of history and director of food studies at the University of the Pacific in Stockton and San Francisco, California. He is the author or editor of 22 books on food, including Eating Right in the Renaissance, Food in Early Modern Europe, Cooking in Europe, and Beans, a History. Uh, he will be speaking here today about the unnatural history of natural food. In other words, how every society frames its conception of what is natural as the opposite of whatever they find wrong with their own food systems. Please, Professor Alpala, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Well, if you'll, as you'll notice, I changed the title just a little bit from a brief history to an unnatural history. Um, and I think it's because the concept of natural food has this very long and fascinating pedigree. For modern people, although we have a very explicit image of fruits and vegetables sort of springing forth on their own volition, we know very well that plants and animals that we use for food have been manipulated over millennia, consciously bred to express the characteristics that make them very useful for us, in fact, anything but natural. Um, the idea of wildness perhaps comes a little closer to what we mean when we say natural, although few people eat much wild food apart from foragers and hunters. And even then, we've manipulated the landscape so thoroughly since our time on the planet that it's difficult to conceive of anything being truly wild, least of which wild parks and preserves, which are very carefully managed. Of course, the flora and the fauna is managed there. Even the microbes, like yeast, we imagine spontaneously populating our sourdough leaven to make bread rise, um, or lactobacilli to preserve our pickles, these have been profoundly altered by our presence on the planet. Again, they're not wild or natural. Our concept of natural food is nonetheless clear and distinct, but it's not based on any rigid scientific definition. The term has no legal basis in food labeling, and in fact, as some people argued, have argued, everything ultimately comes from nature. Therefore, everything on the planet is natural, including poison, right? That doesn't mean it's good to eat. Rather, our idea of natural derives from everything that it is not. For modern people, the implication is that it contains no chemicals or additives, it's not manu mass manufactured by machines, and it contains nothing artificial. And without lingering on that word artificial, let me just say for a moment, it's of course the antithesis of natural, but it has an even stranger history because the word, at least in English, originally denoted something positive. The application of creativity and originality or artifice, and that could do, deal, be with art or even food. In the 16th century, for example, all the wonderful pastries and, and uh, sugar sculptures they made were prized because they were artificial. Um, in a way, the, we would use the word artisanal, um, and of course they, they share a common etymology. Art was opposed to nature, but it was improved at, by the hands of, of humans, and therefore was considered superior. Artificial was a good word. But the word natural has undergone no dramatic semantic shifts and has always stood in contrast to whatever one might to object to in the current food system. So surprisingly, it is always a term of protest. It's, it's only possible when people object to the status quo and imagine a time in the distant past when we were eating what we were supposed to eat, what we were designed to eat. The term natural is thus entirely unnatural, or as we might say, it's a social construct with meaning only insofar as it can be set into historical context. That, and that's the goal of what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to explore um, why the term natural has meant so many different things to different people throughout history and try and get an idea of what that word means. And I should also say that no culture is immune to the allure of natural food, even though it's construed very differently by different individuals. To the average person on the street, if I were to ask you, what does natural mean? You'd probably think, well, it's unprocessed, it's whole food maybe that you can recognize um, or as a particular species, and it's decidedly not something that comes out of a factory, meaning chips, cookies, ice cream, junk food. But it takes a, a very different view ideologically when it's part of a very formal dietary system. For example, let me just give you one out of many modern examples, the paleo diet, is structured around the idea that humans before the advent of agriculture and animal domestication, this is when we were hunters and gatherers, ate far more nuts, berries, lean meat, but very few processed carbohydrates, and they thought those only came in after the Neolithic Revolution, about 10,000 years ago. 
So the paleo diet admits, uh, omits carbohydrates like bread and pasta, as well as animal-based dairy products, under the assumption that these are unnatural, right? We, we never evolved to digest them, is the, is the argument. Um, and it, they dis have decided that these two foods especially are the root of our current dietary malaise and illness, despite the fact, of course, that we've been living on a carbohydrate-based diet for about 10,000 years, <laughs> in the West at least, with uh, wheat, rice in the East, corn in the Americas, but this is certainly nothing new or modern. Now, the idea of revolutionary diet, diet change with the advent of civilization, of course, had, does have a certain basis in history, but it ignores the fact that humans did, of course, eat grains and legumes and starchy tubers long before they were cultivated, actually by probably tens of millennia. Um, we were therefore, and we still are, of course, omnivores. We can live on a very wide variety of plants and animals. Now, whether the diet makes sense scientifically is, of course, entirely beside the point. It's our concept of this original, pristine diet that I find so fascinating here. The idea that natural um, was somehow our, our original food, um, in, and of course is imagined only in contrast to our corrupt, inefficient, unhealthy, modern diet. And again, modern, you know, whatever is natural means the opposite of whatever uh, is the prevailing dietary norm. Um, it only exists when there's a diet to reject, right? And of course, a few centuries ago, people didn't know they were eating organic, right? It's only, we had to invent that as a, as a foil to modern industrial food. Well, let me give you a couple of historical examples to further flesh out this idea of natural food. And the first one is probably very familiar with you. This is Eden. Um, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, this was both a real place and a historical epic wherein humans ate the diet for which we were originally designed. In Eden, of course, the most important thing is that there was no killing, right? There's no concept of good and evil, so the diet was not exactly vegetarian. It's actually one step further than that. It's what we would call fruitarian, meaning that humans only ate what dropped on the ground of its own accord without killing the plant itself. So grains were okay. Uh, beans, seeds, or fruits that fall from the tree, those are perfectly fine. You don't have to kill the plant. Eat those, but a carrot or a stalk of celery, that's murder. Okay, that destroys the plant. Um, and since we were designed to eat this way, according to the biblical account, people lived much longer and were much healthier. Remember, Adam lived to be 800, Methuselah 900 and something. So we were, we were healthier, right? And of course, humans disobeyed. We ate that fruit we were told not to, uh, and then underwent various dietary phases in our history from a time when there were no dietary rules at all after the flood, there are no rules, uh, to a time when kosher laws were, were given, and then in the Christian tradition when those laws were abrogated. But new, new kinds of laws came in, especially fasting regulations. Um, in the course of the early Middle Ages, uh, those were all put in place and regulated officially by the state. Um, now, through all of these various dietary stages, Eden still remained a conceptually a model of how we were supposed to eat originally. And in some cases, it actually inspired monastic movements, in particular the Carthusians, um, as well as some groups who were labeled her heretics, like the, the Cathars, who decided that they should reject meat permanently as something unnatural, something we were not, never meant to eat. Um, now, we might assume that maybe these people had some interest in animal welfare like we might, uh, or, some, or in other words, their vegetarian was, vegetarianism was something like ours. Uh, but in fact, nothing could be further than the truth. The early Christian theologians who wrote about fasting, this is St. Basil and St. Um, Jerome, were far less concerned with animal suffering than they were on the negative physical consequences of consuming flesh. Now, I'm going to need to just explain a couple of uh, ancient Greek medical ideas here for a moment. These ideas ideas are based on, mostly on Hippocrates and Galen. They come from uh, a system called humoral physiology. But in a nutshell, what it says is that the foods that are very much like our own flesh, namely meat, um, is most easily assimilated into our substance and it replenishes us. In other words, you know, your hand withers a bit and then when you eat meat, it re restores it. Um, and thus, meat is very nutritious, and in fact, a, a great deal of it, um, or a plethora, a whole mess of uh, nutritious matter, is either stored in the body in the form of fat, or goes directly into the production of sperm. And the Greeks believed that men and women both have sperm. I know, what were they thinking? But it's, um, this was their idea. So, 
Now, having that, it means the libido is signaled. It inclines us, therefore, to procreate. And for an ascetic, someone who is a celibate monk, um, there could be nothing more dangerous. That's something you don't want to happen. So even for ordinary people, a diet based on meat could be an inducement to sin. That's really what they're concerned about, not animals. Um, now, this underlies the whole logic of Christian fasting. It's not merely to punish and subdue the body in order to make the spirit stronger, and this is, of course, in that whole period of Lent when you're supposed to be atoning for your sins, but to intentionally be undernourished, to staunch the process of sperm production and remain pure in thought. So vegetables, while not very nourishing, were fine in Eden, and of course in Eden they didn't have to labor, so they, they could live on vegetables, but that is how we were meant to eat, but since we we were punished with earning our bread by the sweat of our brow, that was Adam's punishment at least, meat is necessary for hard work. On the other hand, for the ascetic who does no manual labor, whose job is really just to pray for the souls of others, a salad is the perfect penitential meal. Okay. Um, it's cold, it's moist, it's not very nutritious, and it will function as an anaphrodisiac. It will kill whatever lust you possibly could have. And by the same logic, fish also, cold and moist and phlegmatic, it's perfect for periods of fasting. So it's not like they thought, oh, well, fish aren't really meat. It's that they're cold, so they're, they're not dangerous for us, like meat would be. Now, with this logic, the Carthusians actually got in a lot of trouble, not because they ate salad all the time, but because they wanted to do it year-round. And it says very clearly in the New Testament in many places that all food is good. Remember, it's not what goes into the mouth, but what comes out of the mouth that, that corrupts us, what we say, not what we eat. Um, so to satisfy authorities, the Carth poor Carthusians had to serve meat once in a blue moon, um, and strict vegetarianism actually became a heresy. Um, even though it remained the Edenic, um, Edenic ideal in Christian society, um, and it remained a foil for the corrupt, sinful, meat-eating diet that most people uh, followed. And of course, throughout the history of Christianity, there are many points where they will say, oh, we must return to Eden and be Adamites and run naked and eat vegetables, but it's, it's technically a heresy. Now, the ancient Greeks had a parallel myth of the original pristine diet situated in the Golden Age, and Hesiod gives us the classic source. This is a book called uh, Works and Days. It's kind of a farm manual. And he says, here people, this is the Golden Age, um, never grew old but made merry themselves with feasting and the fruitful earth unforced bear them fruit abundantly and without stint and they dwelt in peace and had rich flocks. So it's very much like Eden in many respects. And in this story, too, of course, humans mess up, and they descend from that golden age to a silver age, and then to the bronze age, and then the one we're living in now, which is the iron age, when men never rest from labor and sorrow day by day, and from perishing by night. In other words, life is now really difficult, and we have to work, and although we can be well-fed, it involves a whole lot of labor. Now, for the Greeks, they weren't concerned about any particular foods that they thought of being natural or unnatural, but rather how one obtains food. And Hesiod makes it clear that, yes, labor is a curse, but we deserve it, and it must be embraced. And this is what he says. Work is, in fact, no disgrace. It's idleness that's a disgrace. Only when humans exercise good management are we rewarded by the gods with abundance. And the concept that they used, it's a really fascinating, one of my favorite words is economicus, uh, or economicus in Greek. Um, we get the words economics from it, which basically just means household management, but we also get the word ecology, which is another kind of household management. They both come from the same root. Um, but he says this, good management is best for mortal men as bad management is the worst. And although we, we may think the golden age is ideal, we uh, actually only the gods can eat without labor. For mortals, it's necessary and natural. So the natural diet is hard work, eating the things that the land produces in abundance. Um, now, for the archaic and classical Greeks, and I think even for the, for the early Romans, there were very few varieties in diet. Pretty much everyone ate the same foods, um, you know, and this is the classic Mediterranean diet. It's things like bread, olive oil, wine, cheese, a little meat now and then, unless there was a sacrificial feast, but in general, there's no distinction based on class or, or, um, or uh, standing in society. Um, and there was nothing people imagined as inherently corrupt with which they could say, this is unnatural, therefore we'll frame another natural diet. Now that situation changed dramatically when we get to the Roman Empire after, um, uh, the, in the Common Era. 
when fortunes could be very easily made, lavish feasts served forth, and the most exotic perversities presented on fashionable tables. And let's just give you an idea of what these are like. Um, they're mentioned in satires. They're also in Apicius's cookbook. There are dormice dipped in honey. That's a little, little mouse. Um, and then you sprinkle it with poppy seeds. Um, flamingos' tongues, sow's womb. In other words, the idea of a natural diet was very easy when people could see that there was this wild extravagance at the upper level of society. They could consider that unnatural and create a foil for it. Um, and here, with the Romans, they expressed their ideas about what we were meant to eat, what was natural for us, what would keep us in health. And the, the writer who I think is most fascinating here, no one really ever thinks of him as being interested in food, this is Seneca. Um, he was a, a Stoic philosopher, wrote tragedies, but also had this long, lengthy correspondence with friends. He would write these essays to his buddies, um, and he expressed these, these ideas. And the underlying philosophy of Stoicism basically says that if you keep your needs to a bare minimum, and this, this in fact includes dependence on other people, that will help you maintain personal integrity and strength and virtue when you really just don't need a whole lot. Um, all things, th those are the only things that, that can't be taken away. Your wealth, your luxuries, people can be taken away, but your strength and integrity can't. So as you can imagine, Seneca looked down on the excess and rampant waste of figures about him. And in fact, the, the name um, Apicius comes to mean um, luxury, excess, ludicrous extravagance. Um, and his name came, became attached to this cookbook, which survives from the, the fourth century AD. Um, so for Seneca and for succeeding generations, just the name Apicius means someone who is addicted to pleasures of the palate. Everything wrong with the current diet. In his mind, um, this obsession with jumbled up flavors and textures and ingredients. So let me give you just a couple of quotes. Apicius, this is Seneca talking, that corrupter of youth, the plague of the age, who after he had spent a prodigious fortune on his belly, poisoned himself for fear of starving, though yet he had 250,000 crowns in his coffer. In other words, he was still very wealthy, but he said, uh-oh, I'm gonna have to start cutting back. Time to just kill myself. It's better than, than having, to, having to throw less lavish parties. In other words, in his mind, he couldn't imagine living without expenditure. And Seneca continues in a general rant against ostentation and luxury, and he says how this makes you weak and dependent. He says, let any man take a view of our kitchens, the number of our cooks, the variety of our meats, and will he not wonder at such provision made for the belly? We have as many diseases as we have cooks and meats, and the service of the appetite is the study now in vogue, meaning we've forgotten everything else, all we care about is food. Sounds very interesting, familiar, doesn't it? Simple meats are out of fashion. They are all collected in one, so that the cook does the office of the stomach, nay, the teeth too, for the food. In other words, he's talking about the, the Romans love to pound up food, make it very smooth, pureed. Um, and he says the, they do the work of the teeth too, for the food looks as if it was chewed beforehand. Here is the luxury of all tastes in one dish, more like vomit than soup. That's the most disgusting thing I've ever heard. But, but, he's, but he knows um, you know, culinary fashions of the time, and he understands that you know an average dish which you'd find in a Roman uh, meal would have vinegar, honey, fish sauce, pepper, herbs, all pounded together into this smooth paste, which doesn't look too appealing. It might taste good, but still. Um, but in his mind, that's unnatural. Um, and of course, in the past, when we worked hard and we got a lot of exercise, our food was much more plain and simple. And for Seneca, simplicity, even purity of food, constitutes what is natural, what is proper for our bodies, what will maintain us in health. Um, he says, we have become slaves to our appetites. We have surpassed the bounds of nature and launched out into superfluities. Um, and for him, it's also a kind of assault on nature in, an, in um, an environmental sense, which is fascinating. He says, where is the lake, the sea, the forest, or that spot of land that is not ransacked to gratify our palate? With our hooks, our snares, our nets, our dogs, we are at war with all living creatures merely to satisfy our taste buds, meaning the hunters and the fishers and everyone. We kill everything, we eat everything. Now, when Seneca invokes the idea of nature, it's partly the earth and the inhabitants, but he also see, has this very specific sense of natural law, what's meant to be right, um, and those things we should do to maintain uh, ourselves and being strong and do our duty and, and so forth. And so Seneca 
for Seneca, he believes that one should largely be indifferent to food that's served, avoiding everything that smacks of wantonness and luxury, but really just getting fed. He says, let there be food, and no matter for the table, the dish, the servants, or for whatever meat uh, with which nature is satisfied, nature provides for health, not delicacy. And he says, if you have to eat on the floor, if you have to use earthen vessels or eat like a poor person, so what? You're still getting fed. Uh, and that should be all, your need, all you need. That's all that nature requires. This is natural law, in a sense, for him. Happiness is not delicacies. Um, so it's a very different concept of natural food than one would find in the Christian tradition. Um, and... Um, and it's obviously co different from common custom, um, but it doesn't have many specific guidelines. It doesn't tell you exactly what to eat, just that it should be simple. Now, in, in an era that is comparable with perceived luxuries and corruption of diet, um, let me turn to an 18th century philosophe. This is Jean-Jacques Rousseau in 18th century France who gave us a very much more specific conception of what natural food should be. And in fact, I would argue Rousseau really invents the modern concept of natural food. For him, the delicate pastries and com complex recipes of haute cuisine in the Ancien Régime um, depart from nature, which to start with, our food was very good. That's, that is, and he means everything. He means um, our own human nature. He means the state of nature um, at a time when we were honest, happy, and healthy. But, but on the other hand, he said, the farther we depart from this state of nature, the more we lose our natural tastes, or rather habit becomes to us a second nature, which we so substitute completely for the original that we, none of us know any longer what the original is. Um, so in his mind, it was, it was cooking, it was fine, fine cuisine that ruined us. And he wrote this really fascinating guide for how to raise children. It's called Emile, um, really fascinating book where he tells us to let our children run around barefoot, have fun, don't learn from books, but learn directly from observing nature. And he's very, very specific about what the artificial diet has become and how it has corrupted us, become our second nature. Um, children, he said, should be fed the simplest of diets. It is not necessary to excite their gustatory pleasure, but only to satisfy hunger. And this will be accomplished by the most common things in the world if we do not set ourselves to work to refine their tastes. Don't give them good food, is what he's saying. And Rousseau criticizes, or don't give them fancy food, I should say. And Rousseau criticizes not only excessive luxury, but any excessive control of diet. And, and in fact, the very idea of dieting became very fashionable. I know it's surprising in the 18th century. But he says, our appetite is immoderate only because we want to give it other rules than those of nature. Always regulating, always prescribing, adding, subtracting. We do nothing without weighing it on a scale. Can you believe that's 18th century, someone saying that? But this scale measures our whims and not our stomachs. I always go back to my first example. In peasants' homes, the bread and the fruit bins are always open, and the children, as well as the men, n do not even know what indigestion is. In other words, they eat when nature calls. They don't have prescribed rules about eating. Um, they have learned to trust their own bodies, not what physicians tell them, and not what fashions tell them to eat either. And for Rousseau, natural means being authentic to yourself, letting your own experience be the guide to what you eat. And very interestingly, it's basically a rustic peasant diet that he finds most natural. It's fruit, breads, cheese, um, water to drink. Very funny that that's exactly the opposite of the, the uh, paleo diet. But in any case, he insists that if you keep food simple, children's palates won't be inured to things like wine and sweets. So let us, I'm quoting here, let us preserve the child in his primary taste as much as possible. Let his nourishment be common and simple, his palates, palate only acquainted with bland flavors so as not to form an exclusive taste. And, you know, you have to wonder, what would Rousseau have, Rousseau have thought about? If you ever go on a menu and you see the things that are designed for children, it's like little, little terrible hot dogs and pizza and spaghetti. It's, it's um, candy, of course, is made for children. He would have thought that's a bad, such a bad idea, making spe spe very specific children's foods and the worst of food. In any case, Rousseau's concept of natural food is framed in direct distinction to the reigning culinary culture of his time, a highly refined style of cooking. Um, and, in fact, Rousseau is famous for having said that it is only the French who do not know how to eat, since such a special art is required to make dishes edible for them, which is, of course, everyone else thought the French knew what they were doing. So, 
As you might imagine, this obsession with natural food reappears every several decades. Um, every time there's a fear of over food processing or t excessive cooking, um, some new set of ingredients or new technology that's perceived to make food unhealthy or unnatural. So, for example, when steam driven mills and steel rollers began to replace the water wheels and grist mills to make uh, ground flour, we have people like Sylvester Graham in the early 19th century telling us that we ought to eat whole grains. Now, that's a really complete reversal of everything physicians have been saying up until that time. White bread was always the, the ideal, but he's saying whole grains are better for us. Uh, the very same fear was generated in the era of muckraking when Sinclair Lewis exposed his expose of the meatpacking industry called the jungle. This is in the um, early 20th century United States. So fear of impurities in processed meat led to an early 20th century do-it-yourself movement that had very explicit ideas of what was natural and unnatural. So let me give you an example of this. This is a book that came out in 1919. Uh, Mrs. Harding Rumler published a book called Natural Food and Care for Child and Mother. And it, and it resonates with Rousseau in some very interesting ways, and it resonates with the presence, al presence also. She said, if children, to keep children vigorous, rosy, and happy on a diet consisting largely of fruits, nuts, vegetables, and dry grains with an occasional taste of animal food, one should rejoice and let well enough know, alone. Nature has arranged it so the best things in life are within the reach of those of moderate means. And of course, she's talking to people who maybe can't afford lots of expensive food. So what's important here is not to be too picky about food. Keeping away anything that's artificial, and by this she includes in, uh, sweetened breakfast cereals, which had just come on the market, anything with added sugar, and only the, uh, when the mother departs from nature does she feel obligated to bring in an expert specialist or a physician. Um, and like Rousseau, nature is to be trusted. Industrial food is inherently evil. And her diet is more or less the standard balanced diet in the first generation that knew something of vitamins, but um, which meant a balance of meat, fruits, vegetables, and grain. But the very interesting cultural spin that she gives us early in the 20th century made her insist on only whole grains, only things like brown rice, unbolted rye, whole wheat, and in general, fruits and vegetables without processing and eaten only in their season. You don't eat things out of season or preserved. Um, and she considered, of course, unnatural anything that was uh, sweet, baked goods like cakes, pies, canned fruits and syrup, ice cream, soda. They're, by and large, the same evils that natural food rejects today. Um, and what's, what I think is most fascinating is her rejection of canned foods, because, of course, that first generation thought canned foods were hygienic and they were preserved, they wouldn't go bad, they'd look good. But she thought, um, avoid giving any canned fruits or vegetables of unknown contents. These frequently contain artificial preservatives, colorings, and adulterations, and sometimes even cause metal poisoning. So she's really afraid of industry in general. Um, Rumler's conception of natural food is framed very clearly as a rejection of everything processed and sweetened. And by this, she includes condiments, vinegar, alcohol, coffee, tea, chocolate, gelatin, which was artificially flavored. And she rejects also spices and strong seasonings. Um, but apart from those, I think it's very close to how many uh, obsessions are still uh, rampant among current health day food advocates. Um, but her ideas also reflect very much the current thinking of the day. Um, the person who came to mind was John Harvey Kellogg, who um, his brother, of course, invented Kellogg's, you know, all the, the cornflakes and all those cereals, which are anything but health food today. Um, and, uh, and other figures like Hereward Carrington, who was this natural food fanatic who believed we should only eat fruits and nuts. And he was a he was a paranormal and a psychic and friends with Houdini. Really, really fat. I have to write a book about him someday. Really fascinating. And not least of which is Horace Fletcher, who's the guy who had this idea that you should chew your food uh, uh, at least 100 times until it just dissolves and goes down your throat. That's called Fletcherizing. But, so she's very much a, a part of her time and place, but, um, but, but still sounds a lot like the... Um, the 60s and 70s. And so let me, let me say just a few words to conclude about the period when I grew up, um, when there was a natural food craze. Um, and I think to ex examine that in its own context um, as part of a counterculture movement, or well, let's just call it the hippie era, um, like any period before, this was a grassroots, spontaneous rejection of mass-produced industrial food and convenience food that really dominated in the 40s and 50s and up into the early 60s. During that decade, cookbooks regu regularly recommended um, using frozen food or canned food. In fact, 
there's a whole cookbook, a fascinating one, written by this woman called Poppy Cannon, who said you could just open cans, dump them in casseroles, and put them in the oven. Um, the entire cookbook comes out of cans. It's really fascinating and dreadful. But, um, but the counterculture cuisine was partly a ref re rejection of artificial additives, a turn toward whole, fresh ingredients, but was also, at the, in the spirit of the times, very much a discovery of non-Western cu cuisines, which they thought were still um, close to the soil, still unadulterated. So out of nowhere, um, things like tofu made a dramatic appearance, um, even though tofu, ironically, is very, very highly processed. Um, so too did lost grains like amaranth and quinoa and millet, which you see on the market again again today. Uh, nuts and berries, as always, become the grounding of the natural food movement of the 60s. Um, yogurt, although promoted earlier in the century as a probiotic and longevity food by figures such as Ely Mechnikov, um, it was really funny. He discovered these people living in Bulgaria, over 100, and he said, why is this? Because they eat yogurt. And so the Dan and Company, of course, promoted yogurt on TV and told everyone, eat your yogurt and you can live to be over 100. Um, but that became a, a very popular natural food in the 70s, along with granola, another, oddly, another um, invention of the early 20th century. And in fact, granola, in a way, became a byword for the natural food movement of the 60s and 70s, as did whole grain uh, brown bread uh, in favor of the uh, sort of light, fluffy, sliced white bread that came plastic. Um, but the quint let me talk about one cookbook, because I think it's the, the sort of quintessential book of this era. It's called the Moosewood Cookbook. It's by a woman named Molly Katzen. Um, very odd in that it was hand uh, Calligraphed. It was written out. It wasn't actually printed, although printed from what she wrote and illustrated, but it also it was completely vegetarian. Uh, and the author confesses in the beginning that she was raised by her mother on things like minute rice. Do you have minute rice here? It's basically instant rice. Um, Campbell soup, Velveeta cheese, which is not really even cheese, um, and frozen vegetables, all the things that were considered the miracle foods of that era. And she had, she, dis she confesses, a conversion experience in which she discovered fresh green beans, lightly steamed, um, and she became uh, infatuated, to, her, to use her words, with fresh vegetables. And she helped start this uh, collective in Ithaca, New York in 1973 called the Moosewood Restaurant, which was um, based on just fresh vegetables. And vegetarianism was becoming hip at the time. Actually, a couple of very important books came out at the time. Francis Moore Lappé's Diet for a Small Planet, um, which argued that grain production for animals was basically not efficient economically and that we should just eat the vegetables ourselves. Uh, Anna Thomas's The Vegetarian Epicure came about. So this is the early 1970s. Uh, but in other words, the movement was very much a reaction to industrial food as it was a reaction to the basic American diet of meat, potatoes, overcooked vegetables, and white bread. And what happened is natural foods started popping up everywhere in the 1970s, um, and on any package you could find the words, all natural, okay? This is in every supermarket shelf. Anything would be labeled all natural, very much the same way it says organic today. Um, of course, there was no strident definition of the term natural on a label, but its implication was that it didn't contain artificial preservatives or additives or colorings. And the irony of the whole movement uh, at the time was that the food industry was able to co-opt the movement. In other words, they said, well, if people want natural food, we'll sell them just that. <laughs> we'll, we'll make another version of all the junk food and convenience food we have. We'll slap the label all natural on it. So you had all natural snack foods, health foods in cans, anything but fresh and whole fruits and vegetables um, were marketed under the label in the interest of profit. So, so again, I, I think it's very much like the use of the term organic today. You know, if you could go into a supermarket, I don't think you, you can find this in Norway, but if you go into an American supermarket, you'll find Cheetos, which are just about the worst junk food on earth, but there's organic, all-natural Cheetos. <laughs> Does that like seem an oxymoron to you? I don't know. So, but the point is, of course, that it's no longer small scale, no, it's no longer local, it's no longer indigenous, it's no longer, um, it's not, you know, uh, it's not like the food movement 40 years before, the industry just could sort of bought into the idea and became, uh, you know, a massive producer of, of natural food, which was shipped across the country, aggressively marketed, and sold in the largest possible outlets. Um, uh, you know, the, the great irony is that the largest distributor of organic food in the U.S. is Walmart. Walmart is, is a, our huge superstore. Um, 
So whether these movements lost their soul when taken over by the food industry is really beside the point. It is a cultural phenomenon. The concept of natural food appealed to a largely middle class, largely white audience, ostensibly as a way to keep themselves health healthy, but I would argue also is that this was a means of expressing distinction. In these periods, one could argue for every preceding natural food movement, what is at stake is really not health. It's really not purity, but it is an expression of class identity. Um, if the teeming masses are eating a very identifiable diet and the wealthiest of people are splurging on expensive luxuries and exotic goods, what better way to gain distinction, and I'm using that term in the same way the sociologist de Bourdieu would have used it, what better way to get distinction than to carve out an alternative culinary niche, one that rejects the people below you and one that rejects those above. One that's affordable, but really requires a lot of knowledge to pick out what's best, and usually combined with um, awareness of social issues, things like fair wages, concern for the environment, animal welfare, those sort of all get packaged together and, um, and get stuck with this idea of what is natural and what's unnatural. Um, and in fact, in the US, there is actually a whole chain of grocery stores called Whole Foods that I think capitalizes on exactly this uh, niche, this market, um, explicitly toward upper, upper middle class uh, consumers and explicitly imbued with the image of natural as a selling point. So if I had to predict, just in closing, where this whole movement will go, um, I think we will have a resurgent resurgence of industrially made food uh, that people feel safe and confident about. Um, I think it might even be genetically modified organisms. I know you have a lot more fear in Europe than people in the US generally do, but I think that that will somehow work its way into our food system and something will go wrong <laughs> and, something, and people will be terribly scared. We'll, we'll have another um, very natural and very new uh, food movement that will echo these, uh, these past ones. Um, but of course, it will only be expressed in terms of what we don't like, not, not in terms of what we do. So I'll conclude there. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>